This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Life is lifing. <laughs> <laughs> I've gritted my teeth so much, I have TMJ. <laughs> and with each new day comes new trials as well as triumphs. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way that we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. And I don't know where I would be without therapy, yeah, in all honesty. For and sure. I've, yeah. And I've been with my current therapist for over a year. And sometimes when we're talking, it's not about, I'm not like crying my eyeballs out <laughs> or talking about my childhood trauma. Sometimes it's just talking to her about like parenting or work or challenges I'm having with like time management or making decisions about stuff. Yeah. It's all little kind, things it's, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Sometimes it's small. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash fruit today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash fruit. This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. Welcome to Fruit Loops, episode 191, Buiti Binafi. Bienvenidos, bitches, and thank you for uh, listening. Yeah. <laughs> Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered and the victims. Because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight cisgender what dudes. What? These crimes rarely get any public attention because the news is racist. Allegedly. And we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. She is an ally, and when we go <laughs> to the barbecue in the sky, we're getting her a plate. <laughs> We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists, just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. So who are we talking about today, Beth? So today we're talking about Junior Pashi Kabunda, known as the Monster of Brussels, a Belgian criminal and murderer. Um, they call him a serial killer. Yeah. But he's not really a serial killer. He's a murderer. Yeah. I'm glad you made that distinction. Also disappointed, there's no mention of waffles in this case <laughs> at all. No Belgian waffles in the script, no. <laughs> well, well, well. Uh, before we get into it, how you doing, boss lady? Yeah. <laughs> Things are going good. I'm pretty busy still, but yeah. uh, it's looking up. It's looking yeah. up. Yeah. Look at us. 2023 is our year. I mean, don't, don't the... say it. Don't say it. You're going to jinx us. Uh, oh, okay. You know what? I'm just going to manifest that <laughs> shit. Quietly <laughs> in my soul is where it's it's all it's all happening. That's where it's but at. look, we can't do any of this stuff without you listening. So we are just really, really grateful that y'all are with us. Yeah. I too am doing well. Family's doing good. It's finally getting some spring weather up in here. Yeah. I've been enjoying sidewalk chalk art. Oh. I bought 200 pieces of wow different colored sidewalk chalk and i'm just out there for hours with my kids and that's awesome oh my god it's so fun so i highly recommend it all right so uh <laughs> what's the next segment oh <laughs> listener letters well hello angels ah <sighs> yeah listen to that what is in the bag beth well, we got nothing in the bag this week. Whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. Really? 
Yeah, oh, man. in a bag. Okay. <laughs> but I just want to say, uh, please fill up our bag. <laughs> <laughs> Send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. <laughs> <laughs> and we may feature it on a future episode. Well, the bag is empty in terms of letters, but we do yes. have a new Patreon. We do indeed. The Patreon is named Sean E. Not certain of the pronouns, so I don't want to fuck that up. But thank you so much, Sean E. For yeah. becoming a Patreon. And where is your air horn? <laughs> Stay tuned for some merch and bonus episodes. And here is your personalized thank you. <clears throat> never gonna give Sean up, never gonna <laughs> let Sean down, never gonna turn around and murk you. <laughs> Good one. And that's for you, Sean E. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, before we get into this episode, we would just like to say that this is a podcast about true crime and people of color. And true crime is difficult to talk about or hear about sometimes, and race can be too, but it's just part of the world that we live in. And as global citizens, we all got to talk about this stuff, y'all. Yeah. And yeah. we want this to be a safe space where we can have discussions about all the things. We're all learning all the time. Beth and I are not experts. Nope. Sometimes we make mistakes, but we just cop to it, learn from it, and keep it moving on our collective quest to be our best sexy selves. Amen. Yeah. And we welcome our listeners to be part of the conversation on Facebook or Twitter at Fruit Loops Pod or email us at Fruit Loops Pod at gmail.com. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a quick break and then we'll get into the story when we come. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present. If you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today. The year goes by fast, especially if you're a business owner. Can you believe it, girls? It's already the second quarter. Santa Maria! <laughs> That's right. 2023 is well underway. So don't wait any longer to level up your small business and set your year up for success. Get ahead of the competition by using Stamps.com to mail and ship. Now, we've been using Stamps.com for years at Fruit Loops Pod. And if you've ever received a thank you or merch from us, we did that with Stamps.com. And did we mention that we love Stamps.com? <laughs> heart emoji, heart emoji, heart emoji, heart emoji. <laughs> It lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or office. It's ready to go in minutes, so you can get back to running your business sooner. Stamps.com is the post office only elevated with rates you literally can't find anywhere else, like up to 84% off USPS and UPS. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. Stamps.com is a one-stop shop for all your shipping and mailing needs. It's a stress-free solution for every small business. With Stamps.com, you can get access to the USPS and UPS shipping services you need to run your business right from your computer anytime day or night no lines no traffic no waiting <laughs> set your business up for success when you get started with stamps.com today sign up with the promo code fruit loops for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale no long-term commitments or contracts just go to stamps.com click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code fruit loops all right, we're back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject today? Our subject today is Junior Pashi Kabunda, who was found guilty of murdering a 60-year-old man, a 74-year-old woman, an 18-month-old little girl, which was his daughter, mm. and the attempted murder of his ex-girlfriend. Yes, so let's get into some stats. Junior Pashi Kabunda, a.k.a. the Monster of Brussels, and by the way, not to be confused with Le Monstre, yeah. who is Marc Dutroux, 
who's a Belgian-born white cishet dude serial killer mm-hmm. whose victims were little girls and we just want to say rest in power to the murder victims in the case love and light to the one survivor what a wow i yeah i don't even know what to say and also yeah. just love and light to those left in the wake of this tragedy right the victims names are benjamin rawitz who was 60 celine mamadou hendrix was 17 years old and that's the ex-girlfriend who survived right their daughter was anais who was 18 months old and marcel de Conin- 74. uh, And that was Celine's grandmother. Yeah. And before we get into it, let's get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Well, the setting is Belgium. And the word Belgium originates from the name Belgica, Mm. given by the Romans to the northern part of Gaul, a region of Western Europe encompassing present day France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and parts of Switzerland, Germany and northern Italy. Interessante. Now, in the Middle Ages, Belgium was divided in fiefdoms or properties owned by feudal lords. I remember learning about feudalism. Yeah. And it sounded like it sucked. <laughs> A merchant bourgeoisie also developed, especially in the harbor towns of Bruges and Ghent. During the Hundred Years' War, what a long time, from 1337 to 1453, several battles were fought in what is now Belgium, and the area acquired a reputation for being the battlefield of Europe. During the late Middle Ages, the Flemish painting school gained international acclaim with masters such as Van Eyck, Mm -hmm. Bruegel, and Memling. Later, Rubens, Jordans, and Van Dyck turned Antwerp into a major art center. Hey, art lady with a degree. Are those important people? Yes. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Um, Protestantism appeared in the 16th century and prevailed in the northern provinces, which broke away, became independent, and later on formed the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which is informally known as Holland. And this also drives me nuts. They called people from the Netherlands and Holland Dutch. Yes. What? (laughs) Netherlands, Holland, Dutch. Dutch. What? Yeah. It's so confusing. (laughs) So the southern provinces remained Catholic under Spanish rule. In 1713, they became part of the Austrian Empire and were known as the Austrian Netherlands, later to become Belgium. And I had a Belgium roommate in college. Oh, did you really? Foreign exchange. Yeah. Wow. What's up, Hannah? In 1792, following the French Revolution, France invaded the Austrian Netherlands. As a result, they were annexed and became part of Napoleon's empire. After the Battle of Waterloo fought outside Brussels in 1815, the former Austrian territories were reunited with Holland into the United Kingdom of Netherlands. Um, I'm just fixated on this word annexed, annexed. which uh, yeah. seemed like a really benign word because I didn't understand it right. until paying attention to more recent news events and how horrific annexation can be yeah. Yeah. for the people who didn't ask for it. <laughs> So in 1830, the Belgians revolted against Dutch rule and became independent as a monarchy. The monarchy. Uh, The second Belgian king, Leopold II, this dude, wanted to establish Belgium as an imperial power. And on February 5th, 1885, he established the Congo Free State by brutally seizing the African landmass as his personal possession. Mm. <laughs> you can't do that to other people's homes. That's so well, crazy. Well, you can, but it's not cool. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Set the record straight. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> this was during the great European quote-unquote scramble for Africa. And in 1870, more than 80% of Africa south of the Sahara was under the rule of indigenous chiefs or kings. Okay. 40 years later, virtually all of it had been transformed into European colonies, protectorates, or territories ruled by white people. Wow. You know what's interesting about this date in this time period? Kind of a culture corner, but not long before this, you know, the mid-1870s, 60s, 50s, Haiti won after really brutal fights with France, won their independence as a slave colony right. and became a nation. And all the white colonizer countries were freaked out. <laughs> and so, I mean, it makes sense. Now I'm looking at it like black and white in front of my eyes, why there was this scramble for Africa to get the resources oh, and yeah, the, the resources, people yeah. before it was, before it's too late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> before they getting, all... Getting their peace. Yeah, exactly. And it's really fucked up. Yep. Anyway... 
However, rather than control the Congo as a colony, as other European powers did throughout Africa, Leopold privately owned the region. What? Like a car? <laughs> the, the king's stated goal was to, quote unquote, bring civilization to the people of Congo. Mm. But they didn't no. ask for it again. And he didn't. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk more about Leopold in a second. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. You buckle your seatbelts. Oh, okay. Hold on to your butts. Leopold's reign over the Congo Free State has become infamous for its brutality and was responsible for atrocities on a mass scale. Yeah. Women were held hostage by the king's soldiers mm -hmm. in order to force the men into labor for valued resources, wow. including rubber and ivory, to personally enrich Leopold. Crops were left unattended and the army seized much of the food that was left. The population succumbed to hunger, exploitation and disease. You know, I don't know what to say. It's 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 awful. And there's pictures of some of the brutality and it's I mean, horrible. It's, it's in writings. It's it's really horrifying. Yeah. The thing that I'll never get out of my mind is that they cut people's arms off, which I think yeah. we'll get into their limbs yeah. off when they didn't acquiesce or do exactly what right. the colonizers wanted. So the author, Joseph Conrad, spent six months in the Congo in 1890 as a steamboat officer for a Belgium trading company. From his experiences, he wrote his novella, Heart of Darkness, which gives a searing picture of the brutal and voracious European quest for Congo ivory. The novel is widely regarded as a critique of European colonial rule in Africa and implicitly comments on imperialism and racism. Estimates vary, but about half of the Congolese population died from punishment and malnutrition. Mm. Many more suffered from disease and torture. Among those who weren't killed, many were punished by having a hand or foot amputated. Mm. Leopold's treatment of the indigenous people was so awful, it was even condemned by other European colonizers at the time. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. And not only did they amputate the limbs, but they would carry the amputated limbs around in baskets, like threatening oh, people like, do you want this to happen to you? I mean, wow. you do what I say. So the Congolese population did fight back, though. Several rebellions were mercilessly put down under Leopold's direction. International pressure eventually forced the king to turn the Congo Free State over to the country of Belgium. And in 1908, the Congo became a Belgian colony called Belgian Congo. The Congolese still had to submit to Belgian law. An implicit apartheid was installed. Corporal punishment remained until late into the 1950s, mm. and laws caused thousands of mixed-race Congolese children to be forcibly deported and taken from the Congo to Belgium. Wow. And I wonder if some of those mixed-race children were products of consensual sex or if there was rape. Yeah. You know. I'm sure there was rape. Yeah. Yeah. The Belgian attitude toward the Belgian Congo was one of paternalism. Africans were to be cared for and trained as if they were children. They had no role in legislation, but traditional rulers were used as agents to collect taxes and recruit labor, and uncooperative rulers were deposed. After World War I, private European and American corporations invested heavily in the Belgian Congo. Large plantations were set up, and in the interior, diamonds, gold, and other metals were mined. During World War II, the colony became an important source of uranium for the United States. Africans worked the mines and plantations as indentured laborers. Railroads, roads, electric stations, and public buildings were all constructed by forced labor. African resistance challenged the colonial regime from the beginning. At least 250 distinguishable ethnic groups lived in Congo, speaking many different languages. So ethnicity or tribalism was introduced by the colonialists in order to divide the people and prevent the rise of nationalism. So divide and conquer, I guess. Yep, yep. That's how colonialism is so effective. The first nationwide Congolese political party, the Congo National Movement, was launched in 1958 by Patrice Lumumba and other Congolese leaders. In January 1959, riots broke out in Leopoldville, now Kinshasa. Leopoldville, he named the city after himself? Yeah. Anyway, after a rally was held calling for the independence of the Congo. Violent altercations between Belgian forces and the Congolese also occurred later that year. And Belgium, which previously maintained that independence for the Congo was not possible, suddenly began making arrangements for the Congo's independence. Wow, interesting. Whoopsies. 
<laughs> yeah, and I, I, you know, they say violent um, altercations, but I don't know what is to be expected when you occupy a territory yeah. and force people into systems and things that they didn't ask for. They didn't want. Yeah. Looking at you, Bush, and <laughs> what happened in Iraq uh, yeah. in more recent memories. The Congo became an independent republic on June 30th, 1960, and adopted its present name, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in 1964. Tribalism and regionalism, which were introduced by Belgium, were major causes of chaos and disruption following independence. So think about what happened in Rwanda. Yeah, they pitted tribes against each other. Yeah, so yeah. history may not repeat itself, but it sure as shit rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> Some Congolese had started settling in Belgium after World War II. After Congolese independence, Belgium faced an influx of immigrants from the Congo. Most of the migrants were post-baccalaureate students who moved to Brussels. One of their first moves was to rename a neighborhood, referring to it as Matanger, after a district in the Congolese capital, Kinshasa. Among the African diaspora in this neighborhood are people from Rwanda, Burundi, Mali, Cameroon, and Senegal. There are over 45 different nationalities represented among the residents and shopkeepers in Matanger, including most African countries. According to one resident, quote, it feels like you're in Africa, but in Belgium, unquote. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. In the early 2000s, the district attained. Oh, my God. So I have a map of the world in my office. Uh -huh. It's huge. It covers an entire wall. Wow. Fuck accent walls. Use a map. Wow. And Africa is like in the center of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my daughter has been messing around with post-it notes. And she put a post-it note on in the center of the continent of Africa. I love you, Africa. And Aww. then on Russia, she put fuck you <laughs> <laughs> on a post-it note. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god your kids are funny <laughs> oh man so anyway uh in the early 2000s the district attained notoriety for gang violence perpetrated by african gangs partly composed of exiled child soldiers remember just gangs they're really scary invoke fear and they may be violent but they're often formed by people who need family who need protection and didn't get it in their homes yeah yeah more recently the area has been reestablished as a safe place to visit every year at the end of june a multicultural festival matanger en couleur is held the date coincides with the celebration of congolese independence that well, sounds rad yeah it does of course, there are many languages and dialects spoken in the country, but Belgium has three official languages, Dutch, French, and German. About 60% of the population lives in the northern half of the country, and they speak Belgian Dutch or Flemish. Hmm. I guess the, the same language, it's just a, a... Different way to refer to it? Yeah, yeah. There are differences between Flemish and Standard Dutch, particularly in pronunciation, vocabulary, and idioms. The French-speaking community lives in the southern Wallonia region and in the capital, Brussels. They make up approximately 40% of the population. And again, there are differences in pronunciation and vocabulary from Standard French. The tiny German-speaking minority found in the eastern regions of the province of Liege on the border with Germany forms roughly 1% of the population. Because these regions were only incorporated into Belgium after World War I, the German spoken here is still very similar to the standard German. During the Black Lives Matters protest in the United States, African Belgians held their own Black Lives Matter protests because anti-blackness is global, so that was really cool. Yeah. To commemorate victims in the Congo and to protest police violence in Belgium. They wanted the statues of Leopold II to be taken down, and some were defaced. The demand for the removal of statues is only the tip of the iceberg and part of a broad anti-racism struggle, which the Congolese community and other African descendants have been highlighting for decades. Yeah, and people who are like, they're just statues. What's the big deal? But, I mean... They mean something. It does. And would yeah. you ask... Holocaust survivors to go to, you know, Adolf Hitler Elementary a School. place where there's a statue of <laughs> yeah, Hitler. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The African diaspora in Brussels has been harmed by the remnants of colonialism. There are reports that Black people in Brussels who experience racism in school, at work, in housing, and also with law enforcement. And just like in the U.S., Belgian police tend to target Black males more than other populations. Fiori Mabeka 
The niece of former Congolese ambassador to Belgium, Joseph Mbeka, took part in the Belgian Black Lives Matter demonstrations. She experienced racism in school. Quote, I had to take my last year twice. My teacher thought I was not motivated. Both years, we did not cover the chapter on Congo, but left it as the last thing to do in June when there was little time to cover it, unquote. Wow. So that is like a deliberate erasure of her identity. And no wonder she wasn't interested, right? Yeah. So Belgium does have a list of serial killers, including Marc Dutroux. Dutro has a connection with the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I, f- I found interesting in that his father was a teacher there and the family returned to Belgium after the African nation got its independence. But as we mentioned earlier, he's a white dude and you yeah. can find him on another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty-four hours ago, I found out the person that I've been dating for the last six months is a con man. That is my sister Emma. Andrew Tonks's lies had been so convincing; she had invested three hundred thousand dollars with him. However, the tables were about to turn on Andrew. What he didn't know was that Emma had discovered his real identity. But to get any chance of justice, Emma had to act like it was business as usual. Coming up in this series. And that's when murder, Mm. all this stuff goes through my mind. I'm really, really scared. I'm assuming Sarah has watched too much Netflix and figures I've been defrauding you. Couldn't be further from the truth. That's what this was, a real life story that seems so unbelievable, but it was actually true. A true story that all starts with one simple swipe to the right. I'm Sarah Ferris. And I'm Emma Ferris. And this is my story, Conning the Con. Now we're going to get into the early life of Junior Pashi Kabunda. What do you got, Beth? Well, since this story took place in Belgium, a lot of the articles that we read were Google translated from French or Dutch. Mm. So some of the quotes which were translated may sound a little off, uh, but we did the best we could with, you know, we don't speak French or Dutch, so nope, nope, <laughs> we nope. did what we could. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, that was just an aside. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Junior Pashi Kabunda was born in 1991 in Brussels. He was described as an unhappy boy who had difficulty getting along with others. By the time he was 14, he was in a gang and was dealing and doing, doing drugs. drugs. <laughs> and using alcohol. <laughs> okay. I miss that little phrase. It's been a while. In May of 2006, when he was 16, he was at a night club. A discotheque is what I imagine it was called. <laughs> in the center of Brussels, when he met a girl named Celine. My name is Celine. I am the best singer in the world. <laughs> Uh, but that's not her. Celine Mamadou Hendrix. And she was just 14 years old. so a little bit younger than him. And she's been referred to in some articles as Métis, meaning mixed race. Now we're going to get into the timeline. What do you got, Beth? Kabunda was Celine's first boyfriend, and the teenagers began a relationship that quickly became intense. Celine lived with her grandparents, Xavier Hendricks and Marcel de Conink Hendricks, for reasons related to her schooling. Soon, Kabunda moved into their home in Waliwa San Lambert a municipality in the Brussels capital region, where he was welcomed with open arms. Marcel considered him her second child. According to Céline, quote, My grandmother always considered him a son. They got along very well. I thought it was mutual, unquote. But Kabunda was a very jealous person. If any boy spoke to Celine or even looked at her, Kabunda would get very angry. Mm. According to Celine, quote, I was in love and a bit silly. I saw it in small, while now I realize that it was serious, unquote. Mm. On three or four occasions, Junior physically attacked Celine. Oh, no. Once he slapped her face. Mm. Another time, he threw a bottle at her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, have you been slapped in the face? I don't think so. I don't recall it ever being slapped so, in the face. It is so, like, a embarrassing. Startling. It's startling. It's embarrassing. It's just such a violation. Like, it's all, yeah. like... I can't find the words right now, but yeah. it is is—it is really just, it's an awful thing to have happen to you. Yeah. You're kind of like, what the fuck? 
talk yeah. afterwards. Yeah. So not good. this relationship is not good. Yeah. On August 29th, 2006, Kabunda and a friend named Laurent Onyeba Konimba, 18, spent the afternoon drinking alcohol and smoking weed or cannabis. That evening, renowned Israeli pianist Benjamin Rawitz, 60, returned to his home in Brussels after playing a concert. Kabunda and Konimba noticed him as he slammed the door of his car, which was parked in front of his house. His suit was folded over his arm and he held a briefcase with his music scores in it. Oh, my God. So getting in and out of a car, now that I'm into true crime, it is a very dangerous. You're vulnerable. Scenario. Yeah. 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 Blind Rage, which is on our Killer Podcast Network and was in our feed for a minute. Great show harrowing story. And that was how she was accosted is getting in and out of her car. And I was with my daughter this weekend and uh, sorry for this tangent, but I was like, you got to get in and out of the car fast. Don't get out until you have everything. Don't unlock the door to get out until you have everything ready to go. Get out quickly. Get into your destination quickly. And then when you get in the car, get in as fast as you can and lock the door behind you. And she was like, I never have to do that when I'm with a daddy. <laughs> I was like, do you think anybody is going to pick up 300 300- six foot three pound daddy and like take him away or <laughs> rape him or or do anything to him no you, uh, we are like very vulnerable humans because of our gender and our color and all those other things so you gotta be careful little girl anyway so yeah um just trying to set the scene it's a dangerous uh scenario so yeah. kabunda and kanimba both agree that it was kanimba's idea to steal the car and it was kabunda who approached the man first benjamin had already opened the front door of his building and was holding his keys in his hand when kabunda approached him supposedly to ask for directions red flag yeah <laughs> the versions of what happened next differ depending on who you ask kabunda or kanimba mm. according to kanimba kabunda hit benjamin according to kabunda Kanimba pushed Benjamin in the back, causing him to hit the door and then the floor with his head, knocking him out. Afraid that a passerby would see them and call the police, the two dragged Benjamin into the building, then took him down to the cellar. They picked his pockets, taking a couple of credit cards. The victim lost consciousness and then regained his senses for a brief moment. He said, quote, why me? What have I done? Unquote. Each said the other, then kicked him in the head. Kabunda claimed that he helped Benjamin into a sitting position with his back against the wall to help him breathe. But Kanimba pulled him back down by the legs and then stomped his head. Kanimba denies that he ever hit or kicked the man. He claims that he left Benjamin in the cellar with Kabunda. He heard shots, went back down and saw Kabunda leaning over the body. The two then fled in the victim's car. The next morning, as two residents were leaving to go to work, they found traces of blood on the stairs in the common areas and followed them to the cellar. They didn't want to go any further and called the police. Benjamin was found in the basement of the building, beaten to death. Junior came home with bloody clothes, telling Celine he'd been in a fight. When Benjamin's murder was broadcast on the news, Celine said, quote, He looked weird. He told me that he was in this story and that he had not killed anyone, unquote. In 2007, Celine became pregnant. In the spring of 2008, the young couple moved to an apartment rented by the grandparents and furnished in anticipation of the birth of their daughter. By the way, what a weird thing to say. You're watching the news with your partner and you're like, he, your partner says, I'm part of this story, I, but, of I story didn't but I didn't kill anybody. anybody. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> the uh, investigation into Benjamin's murder stalled for 18 months until a person called the police and told them that they knew the identity of his killers. Laurent Konimba and Junior Kabunda both were arrested and taken into custody in March of 2008. Two days after Kabunda's arrest, Celine gave birth to their daughter, Anais, on March 10, 2008. Kabunda was underage at the time, so he was sent to a youth facility in braun le chateau In Belgium, these youth facilities are called IPPJ. The young folks there are taken care of by different services and are followed by a multidisciplinary team in order to set up a plan that will help them to reintegrate into society. In my mind, that sounds good. Yeah. Also, well done on getting the hat on the A on the word chateau. (laughs) Uh, So uh, at first, Celine who was a 16-year-old mother at the time, had a hard time dealing with the fact that her boyfriend had been arrested for murder. 
but Kabunda assured her that he had nothing to do with Benjamin's murder and she wanted to give him a second chance. But relations soon became strained between Celine and Kabunda, and over time, it just got worse. They were arguing a lot. Kabunda, who was always a jealous person, became even more jealous. I'm going to ask you about this jealousy element, OG of true crime. Okay. Isn't it just a sign of insecurity? Deep Mm -hmm. insecurity? Yeah. I mean, jealousy is a normal emotion, but when you have extreme jealousy, yeah, for sure. Okay. According to Celine, quote, I don't have as many feelings for him anymore, unquote. During arguments, she had told him a couple of times that he was not Anais's father, but it wasn't true, and she told him it wasn't true. In September of 2008, the youth judge decided that Kabunda could go out on weekend passes while waiting for trial. In Belgium, when people are incarcerated and they are let out for certain periods of time, the objective is to facilitate their reintegration into society. Again, sounds really good on paper, especially comparatively to the United States, which is the worst. Right. But locked up in IPPJ during the week, Kabunda was allowed to spend the weekends at Celine's grandparents in Woluwe Saint Lambert. Marcel would pick him up and bring him to the house. But his jealousy was even worse on these weekend stays. And in May of 2009, the couple broke up. Celine didn't tell her grandparents because she didn't want to prevent Kabunda from seeing his daughter. She also didn't tell the IPPJ because she didn't want to upset his program there. I can understand her feeling yeah, conflicted yeah. about revealing She wants this to help him. Yeah. Right. And not make it worse. Worse. No. Yeah. I mean, I just understand it. And she's also really young. Yeah. 16. Exactly. She's a baby herself. On the morning of Saturday, September 19th, 2009, Kabunda, who was now 20, was let out of the IPPJ for the weekend. Three weeks earlier, they had planned that on that day, Celine would go out with friends and Kabunda was to take care of Anais while she was out. Marcel came to pick him up at the IPPJ that Saturday morning. According to Celine, when Kabunda arrived at her grandparents' apartment, there was no argument between Kabunda and her. Quote, It had been planned for three weeks that that evening I would go out with my friends. Junior agreed to keep Anais, unquote. Kabunda claims that while Celine was out, Marcel told him that he was not the father of Anais. But Celine doesn't believe this, saying she is 200 percent sure that her grandmother would never say such a thing. In any case, when Celine returned home, quote, everything was normal except that Anais and my grandmother were not there, unquote. Kabunda explained that they had gone out and would be back later. According to Celine, he was calm as usual and didn't seem stressed. His eyes were red like when he smoked hashish. Mm. Celine and Kabunda chatted for a while and then Celine moved to the living room to study while he watched TV in Celine's room. Underneath Celine's bed was Marcel's body. Ooh. Anais's body was hidden in the bottom of the wardrobe in the same oh room. Oh my God. <gasps> Holy oh shit. Oh my God. Yeah. Whoa. While Celine was studying, Kabunda approached her, pretending to be interested in her lessons. He then grabbed her by the neck and strangled her with the ties from his boxing gloves. When she passed out, he laid her on her bed and left her for dead. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. That escalated. Yeah. Unexpectedly. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Kabunda spent the night with a girlfriend and they watched a story of a death row inmate in the United States. The young woman who knew that Kabunda had killed Benjamin Rawitz in 2006, but who was unaware of everything that had just happened, told him that he was lucky not to live in the United States. (laughs) The irony? irony. Oh my God, I wish I had a sound effect for that. Oh, well. Now it's time to get into the investigation and the arrest. Hit it, Beth! Celine was not dead. When she came to, she went to a neighbor who called the police. She didn't learn until the next day that Kabunda had raped and killed her grandmother, oh and then suffocated god. their daughter to death. Oh my god. That poor, poor Celine. Horrible. Awful. Quote, it hurt me and it shocked me. I never thought he could hurt them, unquote. For days afterwards, she took painkillers to be able to sleep. I can only imagine. I, I can't. Yeah. It's just really horrible. Yeah. So now we're going to get into the trial. What the what, Beth? Kabunda and Konimba stood trial together in Brussels. The trial began on November 29, 2010, before the Brussels Assize Court. 
Kanimba was charged with the murder of Benjamin Rawitz in 2006. Kabunda was also charged with Benjamin's murder, but also with the murders of Anais Marcel de Conning Hendricks and for the attempted murder of Celine, which I thought was really weird that they had this trial all together. Yeah, I was just question marks. <laughs> yeah, uh, floating above my head. Regarding the murder of Benjamin Rawitz, the two confessed to the facts but shifted responsibility to each other, especially about the blow to the head which killed him, which they described as a crack. Mm. During the trial, Kanimba claimed to have been a child soldier in the Congo, but the court found no evidence of this. Also brought up during the trial was a discussion that Kabunda allegedly had with Kanimba, in which he said that he planned to escape and finish the job. Speaking of killing Celine. Whoa. Which I don't know if it's true, if that's coming from Kanimba. <laughs> oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I get it, yeah. I get it. Letters sent by Kabunda to Celine were introduced at trial in which Kabunda called the youth judge a pute, or whore. So this was the same judge who had decided that he could possibly benefit from weekend releases from the IPPJ. Wow. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> just this guy. Yeah. Kabunda had also written that he would, quote, Make fun of these educators, unquote. It probably sounds cooler in the original language, like make <laughs> fools of them or play with them or something like that. But yeah, thanks, Google Translate. The, yeah, that's the <laughs> literal translation. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Prosecutors described Kabunda as a manipulator. At, at first, I read that as mansplainer. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> He's Look the worst. Your, <laughs> clean your glasses, girl. <laughs> that's usually my problem. <laughs> So they described Kabunda as a manipulator, a calculator, and a liar, and that they were convinced of the premeditation of the crimes. Two educators from the IPPJ testified that Kabunda had good conduct there, but stated that they may have been manipulated by him. Mm, that's a hard thing to admit to yeah. being. So, I mean, I guess shout out to those educators for being forthcoming about Admitting, what, what yeah, happened. Yeah. yeah. The educator said that they routinely spoke with Celine and Marcel after each weekend that Kabunda spent at their home and were not aware of any problems. After learning of the murders, the educator said that they were deeply shocked. The whole team was upset. We felt guilty. Wow. I can't believe they're admitting this. In the yeah. United States, y'all, no. we just had a crazy, like, another mass shooting at a school. And yeah. the bobbing and weaving leaders are yeah. doing about what happened, what this is, is insane. I can't believe that they are admitting that they messed up. Yeah. I, can't, I just am blown away. Wow. Yeah. Americans don't like to they're admit. They're better. Everybody's better than us. <laughs> they look at us like we are the whole state of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> That's embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> For Kabunda, the court and jury found no mitigating circumstances. Referring to the rape, they found that he committed degrading and humiliating acts toward Marcel de Conning. The court and jury also pointed to a lack of empathy. Mm, sociopath? Mm, possibly, sociopath. yeah. In December of 2010, after three weeks of trial, Junior Pashi Kabunda was found guilty on all counts, motherfucker. The murders of his 18-month-old daughter, the manslaughter of Marcel de Conique, and the attempted murder of Celine Mamadou. The jurors ruled that the murder of Marcel was an impulsive act and not premeditated. But premeditation was present in the murder of his daughter Anais and the attempted murder of Celine. Kabunda was sentenced to life imprisonment plus 25 years, but he could be released after 13 years in prison. Kanimba, 22. Wow. Released after 13 years. Yeah, that's it. Wow. That's not. Yeah, it is. I don't know what to say, but Kanimba... 22 was found guilty of manslaughter of Benjamin Rawitz and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. So now let's get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. As far as we know, Kabunda is housed at Neville's prison. In 2021, he began to be allowed weekend passes. The relatives of what the now? victims were in shock, just like Wendy over there. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. David Mamadou Hendrix, father of Celine, grandfather of Anais, and son of Marcel, said, quote, 
It is unacceptable. My daughter could have passed him on the street. Let justice never use the word life again. It no longer means anything, unquote. Mm. His biggest fear is that Kabunda will take another victim. Don't blame him. Yeah. The court could decide to release him conditionally. According to Belgian lawyer Nicholas Cohen, quote, it's not all or nothing. It's not free or detained. It's an execution of a life sentence with a disposition of the court, which means control over almost all of his life. The sentence is currently total, and therefore it is a question of discussing other modalities than only detention between four walls. The purpose of conditional release is to allow an inmate to experience his or her punishment somewhere other than behind bars. A release is always accompanied by a number of conditions, the main purpose of which is to protect the victims. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, how how are you going to do that? Uh, For criminal lawyer Denise Bosquet, this is an essential step to avoid recurrences, which I understand if the crime is like a property crime or something like that, but murder? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And again, are there any prison abolitionists on the line? Me, 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 big me, big me. (laughs) Uh, I believe that it's a big problem, right? Yeah prison reform. And some countries do it way different than the United States. Yeah. Almost anything seems like it would be better than what we have now. But I do believe that there is and should be a place for violent offenders, right? And that yeah. is when prison is appropriate. But for, right. you know, a grandma crack, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, quote, people will have to meet a number of conditions. They will be followed by a justice assistant. We cannot do without parole because it means letting people go to the bottom of their sentence, 15, 20, 30 years. And then we go out and we have no follow-up. It's a guarantee of recidivism, unquote. So now we're going to get into our takeaways and our thoughts on what made Kabunda snap. What do you got, Beth? Well, he's described as very jealous, as Mm -hmm. we were talking about. Yeah. I don't know how he got that way, but according Uh to psychologists, some of the root causes of extreme jealousy include low self-esteem, anxiety, Mm. and feeling possessive of others, particularly romantic partners. Uh And everyone is more jealous in an unstable or unloving relationship. Sure. And which he was in with Celine. Yeah. An unstable relationship. Yeah. So jealousy is centered on the fear of losing someone. An adult whose parents modeled jealousy may tend to be more jealous, and a person who has been betrayed in the past might be more prone to jealousy. Mm. There was probably something that happened in his childhood that stoked the fear of abandonment, but we don't know what that was. A parent who rejected him or was not loving towards him, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That said... We're all responsible for dealing with our emotions and controlling our behavior, no matter what happened in our childhoods. Mm -hmm. It's not an excuse, just an explanation. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, generational trauma, all those things could have played a factor. Right. But right, we do have to. We're responsible for our behavior. We do have to deal with it. Yeah. And it sounds like Kabunda and Celine were in an unstable relationship, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, That's very common with relationships when we're young. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah. (laughs) And our emotions run high, you know. Yeah, yeah. Celine had broken up with him and told him that Anais was not his daughter. Mm -hmm. And even if she told him afterwards that that wasn't true, Mm -hmm. it was probably something that stuck in the back of his mind. Yeah. So he was jealous and angry and wanted to hurt her, I think. Yeah. He also had some extreme anger towards Marcel. I mean, but just why? the way she he took treated care of her. him. I don't know. Uh, we don't have enough information to know why. Yeah. It could be that he had anger towards his own mother and took it out on Marcel. Uh, uh, I don't know. Just speculation. Yeah, yeah. The fact that he raped her is odd. I mean, that yeah. came out of left field. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Really out of left field. And then finally, it's wild to me that the Belgian justice system even considers conditional release for this guy. I know he was young Mm -hmm. when these crimes were committed, but they were horrific. Yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty scary. Yeah, you're telling me. And back to, you know, the jealousy, the records describe him as an unhappy child. Mm -hmm. Remember, he joined a gang and engaged in substance use really early. Right. And 
to me, it sounds like abandonment. Yeah. Like he neglect. N- nobody. Yeah. Nobody was there for him. Right. And then also sometimes when kids appear unhappy or act out, it's because something happened to them or is happening to them and they don't have the language to articulate it. Right. 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 And I imagine the resources that would have been profoundly effective for a black first generation kid may not have been available to him. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe they did. They do let they do let him out of prison with a babysitter. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe they were available. <laughs> so, <laughs> But if they were, where were they? And we didn't see any evidence of that right. resources. Right. But uh, when you are an immigrant kid, a first generation kid, a kid growing up in poverty, survival is it. Thriving isn't necessarily part of the game. You know, I can still hear my mom in my ear. But did you die? <laughs> like, yeah. And, and from an immigrant <laughs> perspective, if you didn't die, then, then you're, you're all right. okay. Everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the intimate partner violence is also kind of telling. And with Celine, it started out small, little fits of jealousy, and then it escalated to murder. And yeah. I just think that Kabunda is, uh, he was a young, insecure male. He was manipulative, which I think is a sign of narcissistic personality yeah. disorder. Yeah. And that baby girl was oh, so yeah. beautiful. So I saw lots of pictures of her on the internet and she was just taken from the world so soon. I cannot imagine her surviving mother Celine's pain, that family's pain of having to lose a, a baby and, you know, a matriarch in their family. And then my impression from researching this case and my prior listening of Le Monstre podcast uh-huh. is that Belgium law enforcement and authorities are corrupt incompetent messy ass oh wow wow and that was in the 90s this case took place in the earlier 2000s 2000s yeah so maybe there's was a bunch of change but then again maybe not yeah and this case really challenged my thoughts on prison abolition but not it didn't change them it challenged them but it didn't change them right incarceration can be the most appropriate place for those who commit the most heinous crimes who are a danger to others and for whom rehabilitation is just not possible. Right. And I think Kabunda would be in that number. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, now it's time to talk about how not to get murdered. So if you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. (laughs) (laughs) This segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. Well, this is just my thoughts after getting into this case is intimate partner violence and mental health support. Okay. Intimate partner violence. Um, there are so many resources available, but I do know we've talked about the hotline.org. There's also RAIN, which is the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Networks, because the intimate partner violence, it can be so insidious. Yeah. And you can, people can suffer in silence and it starts out small. Right. Just like Celine described. Exactly. It it doesn't end well. So you can call 866-331-9474 in the United States. Visit the hotline.org. And you can also call 800-656-HOPE. And then for mental health, there is the 988 hotline number. So instead of calling 911, if somebody's having a mental health crisis, you can call that yourself or call that for somebody you care about or text home to 741741 in same same situation if you're concerned about somebody or concerned so about yourself. So you text the number 741741 and, and you say home? And you type home. Yeah. Okay. And then okay. They'll, they'll reach back. And I personally have used oh, wow. that hotline and so they so it's like a text conversation it's a text conversation yeah okay. um and they'll find out like where you are and sort of kind of assess what you need do you just need to kind of talk it out or right at least that's what it was for me so anyway there's help out there so you don't have to nice. kind of just um suffer well thank you yeah 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 well, this will be in our footnotes yeah. and uh any 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 other tips no nope. also send us your tips y'all yeah yeah. Six oh two nine three five six two nine four. Nine four. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's get out to the shout out portion of our All show, right. where we shout out any content by people of color, any marginalized folks, or any true crime goodies. Whoa! 
friend. CSI on Trial podcast? What? What? A podcast about how the forensic science we see on TV and think is used to solve crimes uses more forensic bullshit and not very much (laughs) science. And the consequences are disastrous. Oh, wow. People are taken away from their families and incarcerated when the science doesn't support that they did it. Yeah, I know that there's a problem with people believing things that they see on CSI and expecting courts to to be like TV, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it, it just isn't. And it is uh, also unfortunate because then the real perpetrators and the real criminals right. don't get caught. Right. And so this podcast is amazing. It, it ta- They talk to people who've been victimized by junk science and falsely convicted and incarcerated and also talks to experts on wow. trials and also forensic scientists, like real, really like real scientists. Yeah. <laughs> what do you got? Uh, well, I wanted to shout out Party Cruise Podcast. Oh, yes. Have you been Thank listening you. to it? I haven't yet. It's uh, okay. I, I didn't know if it was out yet. Is it out? Yeah, it's out. Okay, okay yep. cool, cool, cool. So Party Cruise is a podcast about coming of age in L.A.'s Latinx teenage underground party scene, mm. which I knew nothing about. So it was really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Many adults saw the scene as gang adjacent uh-huh. and the media fueled negative stereotypes of the kids who they said we're out of control. And yeah. one of the teens was a girl named Emery Munoz, who was murdered in 2006. Ooh. So this is a story about the party scene and also of Emery's murder. Yeah, um, I I really have enjoyed. Actually, y- you know what? Yeah, I lis- I've listened to one episode. I don't one know how episode. many are okay. out. Yeah, and right. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Just kind of how it came about and this, you know, young journalist and telling her story and then interviewing Something the family members. Something cultural I knew nothing about. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So this is this is why we fell in love with podcasts in the yeah, first place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those shout outs are CSI on Trial podcast, wherever you get your podcast and Party Cruise. And Cruise is spelled C-R-E-W-S podcast, wherever you get your podcast. <gasps> Oh, my God. All right, Beth, <laughs> where can the people find us? Our website is fruitloopspod.com, and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five-star review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, hey, this is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, let go live, y'all. It's crazy out there. Get the show on the road. On the road. And two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. What the hell is going on? You're not doing drugs. No, no. <laughs> Guilty on all counts, motherfucker. Represented it. <laughs> Represented it. <laughs> <laughs> also disappointed, there's no mention of waffles in this case <laughs> at all. X, X. <laughs> I don't know what. What? X. X. Uh, Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you about this. (laughs) You're going to jinx us. Uh, Oh, okay. You know what? I'm just going to (laughs) manifest that shit (laughs) quietly (laughs) in my soul is where it's it's all it's all happening. On Russia, she put fuck you. (laughs) I don't post it. Everybody's better than us. They, they look at us like we are the whole state of Florida. <laughs>
Yeah, what the fuck? How do you say crazy in French? I Zutalo! It's crazy out there! <laughs> Fou or full. Full. C'est full. <laughs> C'est full in these streets. Yeah. <laughs> Got him! Got it! Got it! Yeah, we did it. Bye! Bye! Something is creeping in. Don't follow it down. 24 hours ago, I found out the person that I've been dating for the last six months is a con man. That is my sister Emma. Andrew Tonks's lies had been so convincing, she'd invested $300,000 with him. However, the tables were about to turn on Andrew. What he didn't know was that Emma had discovered his real identity. But to get any chance of justice, Emma had to act like it was business as usual. Coming up in this series. And that's when murder, mm. all this stuff goes through my mind. I'm really, really scared. I'm assuming Sarah has watched too much Netflix and figures I've been defrauding you. Couldn't be further from the truth. That's what this was, a real life story that seems so unbelievable, but it was actually true. A true story that all starts with one simple swipe to the right. I'm Sarah Ferris. And I'm Emma Ferris. And this is my story, Conning the Con. <laughs>